Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media I am Dr Nick Nickum a cardiologist from Houston Texas This is cardiology seminars brought to you by Triple N Media on our YouTube channel we have more than 200 cardiology lectures uh, on various uh, topics we welcome you to read we welcome you to watch those videos and please please do subscribe to our youtube channel the information provided in these videos is for education and entertainment purposes only and is not a professional advice if you would like me to research on any topic in cardiology i will be more than happy to research and produce a video for your benefit if you would like to get a copy of my cardiology rotations manual which has more than 175 pages of chock full information please send me an email and i will tell you how to get that one at the end of this presentation the feature presentation for today is atrial fibrillation acute atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response stable versus unstable bedside treatment you are called into an emergency room to see a patient with a heart rate of 190 or maybe 200 the patient is sweating the patient is short of breath the patient has some discomfort what are you going to do you watch this entire presentation then you will know what to do if you are dealing with a patient with atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response uh, first of all we have to decide is this patient hemodynamically stable meaning the patient has uh, adequate blood pressure maybe 120 130 over 70 80 mm of mercury the oxygen saturation is okay the patient is not acutely short of breath the patient is not uh, profusely sweating So if the patient is stable then we have a different approach. On the other hand if the patient is hypotensive blood pressure 80 90 mm of mercury heart rate over 200 beats per minute the pulse oximetry shows the oxygen saturation is 88% the patient is little upturned what do you do you do direct cardioversion if the patient is unstable direct cardioversion now let's talk about hemodynamically stable patient the patient is in emergency room has little sweating mild shortness of breath the blood pressure is okay the patient is alert the saturation is 94 96% on room air so what do we do next we have two options number 1 we can focus on rate control and number 2 we can focus on rhythm control the management of atrial fibrillation patient is very complex it deals with the atrial fibrillation rate it deals with the atrial fibrillation rhythm it deals with the left ventricular function and its effects it deals with the quality of life and it also deals with prognosis and we have to worry about anticoagulation just dealing with an atrial fibrillation is not about just controlling the rate or controlling the rhythm there are mul- multiples of issues that we have to address but in the immediate phase we have to decide do we need rate control or rhythm control unless you are a specialist trained in atrial fibrillation rhythm control i wouldn't try that as a first attempt because there are certain issues which i'm going to show you in a minute which we need to be focusing upon particularly the clot and embolic uh, phenomenon Let's talk about rate control. Rate control can be divided into two different groups of patients. Those patients who have left ventricular failure with an ejection fraction of less than 40%, they are treated with beta blockers cautiously and they may also be treated with amiodarone or digoxin. I'm going to get into the details of exactly what dose we give and what's the duration of action what is the onset of action and things that we need to worry about if the ejection fraction is greater than 40% then we can try beta blockers or non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers or digoxin but if the ejection fraction is less than 40% then we need to avoid calcium channel blockers that's the main thing and we talk about iv amiodarone let us focus on rhythm control when it comes to rhythm control the first question is how long did this patient have this atrial fibrillation is this a chronic atrial fibrillation with recurrence of rapid ventricular response or is this a new onset atrial fibrillation 
If this is a new onset atrial fibrillation, how long did the patient have the atrial fibrillation? If the patient had new onset atrial fibrillation for less than 12 hours, uh, and no recent history of stroke, TIA, or if the duration was less than 24 to 48 hours, and if the patient has a Chad Vass score of uh, 0 to 1, that means low risk for thromboembolic events, then we can proceed with cardioversion. If the patient doesn't meet these criteria, we can start them on oral anticoagulation agents. Then once the rate is controlled, we can do a TEE, transesophageal echocardiography, and if we can exclude a left atrial thrombus, these patients can proceed to elective cardioversion. There are pharmacological agents that can also be used, but they are going to be mostly useful in acute new onset atrial uh, fibrillation, but the chances of them going back into sinus rhythm, going back into atrial fibrillation may be much higher than what you would expect. But from a clinician point of view, if you are an internist or an intensivist, I think our main focus would be to control ventricular rate and look at all these exclusion criteria so that we can get these patients prepared for transesophageal echocardiography and possible cardioversion. Okay, let us look at each one of these drugs that we use for management of atrial fibrillation with the rapid ventricular response. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this chart because this is the most important chart you need to know as far as managing supraventricular tachycardia with a rapid ventricular response, be it atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. But if you have a PAT, the treatment is totally different where you use uh, where you use adenosine. Okay, let's talk about the drugs that are available. We talked about the beta blockers. I talked about the calcium channel blockers. I mentioned amiodarone, and we also mentioned I also mentioned digoxin. So let's look at each one of these drugs. Low pressure can be given to slow the rate. It is given like five milligrams over two minutes as a bolus lasts for 15 to 20 minutes, so it's a short duration, and we can repeat the dose two to three times. The same thing with metoprolol, we, we have a similar dosage regimen, but the thing is, you may buy time, like 20 to 60 minutes, 20 to maybe 30, 40 minutes, but beyond that, we need something definitive to bring the rate down consistently. For that, we have oral metoprolol, 25 to 100 milligrams, which can be given every 12 hours, or it can be given every six hours in an acute situation. It is sort of intermediate and long-term uh, treatment plan. One of the things we need to be concerned is uh, hypotension, heart blocks, and you can use them only in patients with ejection fraction greater than 40%, unless they are on good treatment for heart failure. Cardizem, is along the same lines as far as indications are concerned. You can give a bolus of 15 to 20 milligrams and followed by a zero point, followed by 10 to 15 milligrams per minute. I'm sorry, per hour it should be. 10 to 15 milligrams per hour infusion to bring the rate down. While we are giving this cardizem intravenously, we should simultaneously start these patients on oral medications so that we can minimize the duration of the infusion because IV infusions cost 10 to 20 times more than oral medications. At the same time, they can be treated with 40 to 80 milligrams of cardizem every eight hours, up to a maximum dose of 240 milligrams. And again, we have to watch for their left ventricular ejection fraction as it can have a negative effect if the ejection fraction is less than 40%. Verapamil is very similar to metoprolol in terms of its action, may be blockade, and that's why we need to be concerned about uh, heart blocks and bradycardia and hypotension. One of the advantages of verapamil is something that we can use in patients with a severe COPD where bronchospasm may not be an issue as it is seen with beta blockers. Verapamil can be given 5 milligrams IV bolus, which lasts for about 20 minutes. 
In the meantime, they can be started on 30 to 60 milligrams uh, orally every six to eight hours, a maximum of 240 to 800, 200 and, 240 to 480 milligrams per day. Amiodarone is uh, a drug that is used for chronic atrial fibrillation. It can also be given acutely, but you, you have to infuse it over a 24 hour period and it is an expensive intravenous medication. It costs close to $1,200 for a 24 hour duration treatment. You give a bolus of 150 milligrams per minute. The reason I'm saying is that you need to select the drugs that can do the job at the least cost. Infusion and after six hours, you reduce the dose to 0 0.5 milligrams per 18 hours, the maximum of 2.2 grams over a 24 hour period. Digoxin has taken a back seat, but in my own practice, I find digoxin to be quite useful in patients with COPD, in patients with other problems, in patients who are hypotensive, where I can give digoxin. The only concern I would have would be renal patients, but we adjust the dosage based upon their creatinine function and GFR. The loading dose is the same, 0 0.5 milligrams IV bolus. Then after six hours, you see how, what the heart rate response is. You look for ectopics, and then you repeat 0 0.25 milligrams every six hours as needed and follow up that with a digoxin level 24 hours later. Again, you monitor for uh, PVCs. So ladies and gentlemen, that is in a nutshell, a quick review of uh, atrial fibrillation, stable and unstable in an intensive care unit in the emergency room or at bedside. Obviously, you're not going to treat these patients at bedside. You're going to transfer them to the intensive care unit. If you would like to get a copy of my cardiology rotations manual, please send me an email at drnicknickum at gmail.com and I'll be very happy to send you. And this book has 175 pages of chock full information for bedside management of cardiac patients and it has linked to more than 200 videos I have on my YouTube channel. Saying YouTube channel, here we have more than 200 lectures and please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. And this cardiology seminar has been brought to you by Triple N Media. And please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and I will see you in the next video.